So I'm going to speak to you today about the devolving nature of guardianship rights for unmarried fathers under Irish law. And there are four ways in which an unmarried father can acquire guardianship rights um, under Irish law. The simplest way is by marrying the mother of his child if he's in a position to do so. But if he's not in a position to do so, these three means are how he can acquire guardianship. In 1987, legislation was introduced which enabled the unmarried father to apply to the court to be appointed a guardian. A decade later, an unmarried father was permitted to make a statutory declaration in agreement with the child's mother um, that would appoint him as a guardian of the child. And more recently, in 2015, legislation was introduced enabling an unmarried father to automatically acquire guardianship rights simply by cohabiting for 12 months with the child's mother. But he must remain cohabiting for at least three months after the birth of the child. So of the 12 months, at least three of those months must be cohabitation that takes place after the birth of the child. Now, all of this started in the 1980s with a case called Johnston and Ireland, um, whereby a, an unmarried couple, I suppose, took a case to the European Court of Human Rights, challenging Ireland's constitutional ban on divorce, because essentially Mr Johnston was in a non-marital relationship and had a daughter within that relationship, and he was unable to be appointed a guardian of his non-marital child, um, Nessa Williams Johnston. So the family challenged as being in breach of Articles 12 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, Ireland's constitutional ban on divorce. Now, long story short, the European Commission on Human Rights, and this was confirmed later by the Court of Human Rights, found that there was no breach of Article 12 um, because the right to marry does not guarantee the right to divorce and subsequently remarry. And they found that there was no breach of Article 8 in that Ireland did not have to provide unmarried couples with a status analogous to married couples. However, looking at the situation from the child's perspective, the European Commission on Human Rights and again later the court found that there was a breach of Article 8 in that the situation of the third applicant, the non-marital child, Nessa Williams Johnston, breached the right to respect for family life of all three applicants. So by not being able to have her father um, legally appointed as a guardian and by, at the time anyway, not being able to um, inherit from her father's estate, there was a breach of Article 8 um, because the right to respect for family life of the non-marital child um, was breached by Ireland in this case. However, the European Court of Human Rights held that it is not the court's function to indicate which measures Ireland should take to remedy this breach of Article 8 that it had found. But Ireland did remedy the breach. It did not introduced divorce, although it tried because there was a referendum in 1986, uh, merely weeks before this case was heard in Strasbourg, but that referendum failed. The subsequent divorce referendum in 1995 was, however, successful. What Ireland did was it introduced the Status of Children Act 1987, enabling the unmarried father to be appointed a guardian of his child by the court. And this would have been perfect for Mr. Johnston because his situation, um, even though he was in a long-term cohabiting non-marital relationship, the reason he couldn't marry the mother of his child and become guardian of um, his daughter was because he was married to someone else and was unable to divorce that person. So now he could apply to the court in Ireland seeking to be appointed a guardian of his child. However, in the years following 1987, the judicial approach to guardianship applications was to equate the probability of success as being dependent on the strength of a father's relationship with the child's mother. The courts really required the unmarried father to be in a relationship akin to marriage with the child's mother. I'll just briefly read out what 
was said by Chief Justice Finlay in the case there, JK and VW, which was later followed in WOR and EH. He said that as regards guardianship applications by unmarried fathers and how the outcome could vary, the range of variation would, I am satisfied, extend from the situation of a child conceived as a result of casual intercourse, where the rights might well be so minimal as practically to be non-existent, to the situation of a child born as a result of a stable and established relationship and nurtured at the commencement of his life by his father and his mother, in a situation bearing nearly all of the characteristics of a constitutionally protected family, when the rights would be very extensive indeed. So it's clear from this that the unmarried father in a long-term cohabiting relationship with the mother that is virtually akin to marriage was the court's preferred candidate for guardianship rights at this point in time. It was similar in Strasbourg because the European Court of Human Rights also placed emphasis on the strength of the relationship between the child's parents when adjudicating on the unmarried father's right to respect for family life under Article 8. Indeed, in Johnston and Ireland itself, by finding that there was a breach of Article 8, the court noted that the relationship was one where parents who have lived with their daughter in a family relationship over many years had a close and intimate relationship. So the court really looked at the strength of the mother-father relationship in Johnston In Keegan and Ireland, although the mother-father relationship in that case was no longer subsisting, the court did note that the parents had been in a two-year relationship, which included one year of cohabitation um, and an intention to have a child and to marry, even though that relationship ended before the child's birth. Nonetheless, the court found that the parents' relationship had the hallmark of family life, and therefore, from the moment of her birth, family life under Article 8 existed between the unmarried father and his daughter in that case. But largely, it seems, because the parents had been in a long-term relationship, one year of which was a cohabiting relationship. Now, more recently, the case law on Article 8 and unmarried fathers demonstrates that the court in Strasbourg is now more preoccupied with the father's willingness and ability to care for his child, the father-child relationship, or the court really examines the caring intentions the father has towards his child, taking the emphasis off the strength of the mother-father relationship. Similarly, in contemporary guardianship applications in the Irish courts, the strength of a man's relationship with the child's mother is no longer crucial to a successful guardianship application. It now appears to be his commitment to the child that appears essential to the court. And just to give you an indication of how far Irish law has come, we saw that in the 1980s and 1990s, the courts required the biological unmarried father to be very committed to the mother of his child, to be in a long-term cohabiting relationship, And by 2009, we had a situation where the Supreme Court in MACD and L there was open to appointing as a guardian a known sperm donor father. This was a man who had never cohabited with the child's mother or never had any form of um, sexual or emotional relationship with her. He was a friend of the child's mother and her same-sex partner, and he had agreed to provide them with sperm to enable them to have a child via home insemination. As happens in some of these cases, both in Ireland and the UK, the relationship between the parties broke down after the birth of the child, and the known sperm donor father, as we might call him, um, was entitled as the biological father to apply for guardianship and access rights to the child under existing legislation. And he did so. And what's interesting about this case is that it was appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. And even though the Supreme Court did not appoint the unmarried father in this case as a guardian of the child, the court did note as follows. Justice Denham stated that the father, who was a sperm donor, has rights as a natural father, as provided for under the Guardianship of Infants Act 1964, as amended, to apply to be appointed guardian of the child. Now, they didn't appoint him, but it's interesting that the court 
seems to indicate that if the evolution of the father's relationship with the child warrants it, he could be appointed a guardian at a later date. So again, we've come from a situation where we had the necessity for cohabitation and commitment between mother and father to a man who might have donated sperm under some sort of sperm donation agreement to a same-sex couple in order to have a child to that man now being considered by the courts as potentially appropriate for being appointed as a guardian. Justice Denham held that there is benefit to a child in general to have the society of its father and she noted that there should be no order of guardianship made in relation to the father at this time. As in all family law matters, issues may be readdressed in changed circumstances. Justice Fennelly, on similar lines, stated that it is, of course, possible that a time will come when a guardianship application might be renewed in the High Court in different circumstances. So the Supreme Court awarded him access rights, but not guardianship, but nonetheless envisaged that this man, who was initially, anyway, intended as a known sperm donor father, um, could acquire rights of guardianship in relation to the child. Quite a fascinating um, journey the courts in Ireland have been on since the 1980s, as you can see. Again, in 2013, in MOR, we had a situation where the children had been abandoned by their mother and the man who had been in a relationship with her, essentially their, their non-biological social father, acting very strongly in a position of loco parentis to the children, um, was appointed a guardian of the children by the High Court. So, you know, we're looking at a situation where known sperm donor fathers or non-biological social fathers are being embraced by the courts when it comes to guardianship applications. Legislation, however, tends to differ. So I mentioned earlier that a uh, statutory declaration can be used by an unmarried father in agreement with the child's mother to have him conferred with the status of guardian. And I'm going to spend a moment on that because that mechanism works very well if you're an unmarried father who is on good terms with the child's mother because her consent is, of course, essential. And it obviates the need for a court application, especially for those couples who are in what was, anyway, the court's preferred, stable, uh, marriage-like cohabiting relationship um, and makes it easier for the father to, and less costly for him to acquire guardianship. The problem with this, however, or the drawback, is that the unmarried father is not often aware that he can avail of the statutory declaration, and this mechanism is not often used to acquire guardianship rights. Also, even if it is utilised, there is no register of these statutory declarations, so if it is lost, there is no record of the father's guardianship rights. However, in 1997, I think this was rather progressive because despite the lack of awareness and the uptake on the use of this type of statutory declaration, there is no requirement for the unmarried father and the child's mother to be in any form of relationship in order to make the declaration. All that is necessary is their agreement. However, by 2015, the Children and Family Relationships Act provides that an unmarried father can acquire automatic guardianship if he has cohabited with the child's mother for 12 months, including a period of at least three months cohabitation after the birth of the child. So we're kind of regressing here, and that's why I talk about the devolving rights in this paper, because it looks like more recent legislation will provide the unmarried father with automatic guardianship. Well, not really automatic if it's only three months after the birth of the child. If he has made a significant commitment to cohabitation with the child's mother. And this is very similar to the early judicial approach to awarding guardianship in the court. Um, some have lauded this for enabling an unmarried father to acquire automatic guardianship, you know, without the need for a statutory declaration or a court application. But it's not really automatic. It's three months after the birth of the child. And that can be significant where, let's say, the cohabiting parents are in disagreement about important decisions that need to be made in relation to the child's welfare before the father acquires guardianship. Also, given current astronomical rental and property prices in Ireland, many committed unmarried couples are simply unable to afford to live together with their child. And consequently, unmarried fathers are often able, unable sorry, to acquire guardianship rights by virtue of this statutory reform. 
Now, we've seen that the unmarried father's rights under the 1997 and 2015 reforms, they make his ability to acquire guardianship very much dependent on the strength of his relationship with the child's mother, rather than looking to the strength of his relationship with the child or the potential of that relationship, as the courts have been doing more recently. We've been informed by the then Minister for Justice and Equality when the 2015 Act was being introduced that the guardianship reforms contained therein reflect existing constitutional protection for marital fathers and are the consequence of legal advice. Yes, Article 41 of the Constitution of Ireland protects marriage on which the family is founded and that married family unit, but the more recently inserted Children's Amendment in Article 42a recognises and affirms the natural and imprescriptible rights of all children, and the state shall, as far as practicable, by its laws protect and vindicate those rights. So I would argue that, although the guardianship provisions in the 2015 Act are deferential to the constitutional primacy of the married family, they have insufficient regard for the potential of the Children's Amendment to temper this protection afforded to marital fathers and, you know, maybe look at equating the legislative position of all fathers, a la guardianship, if we look at it from an Article 42a and indeed a child-centric perspective. Children might enjoy a natural constitutional right to family life under Article 42a. But the upshot of the 2015 Act is that the state is, for the most part, placing the need to protect the constitutional integrity of the paradigm marital family above the need to vindicate, as far as practicable by its laws, this fundamental constitutional right of the non-marital child. It's, you know, constitutional right to family life or respect for that family life. I argue that a more measured way to balance the position of the married father in Article 41 and the unmarried father, or sorry, the non-marital child, which would also benefit unmarried fathers in Article 42a, would be to preserve, of course, the automatic guardianship rights for, for married fathers that arise upon the birth of their child, while facilitating the acquisition of those rights for unmarried fathers as quickly and as easily as possible after birth, irrespective of any cohabitation period with the child's mother. This could be achieved if Ireland followed the approach in New Zealand and England and Wales and enabled unmarried fathers to acquire guardianship rights in those situations where the mother consents to registering the father on the child's birth certificate. So this reform, registration of the father on the birth certificate and by that the automatic acquisition of guardianship rights would remove the need for any cohabitation period or the little used statutory declaration. Also, by having his name on the child's birth certificate, there would be a record of the unmarried father's guardianship rights, unlike the situation with statutory declarations that can be misplaced. Um, so men who cohabit with the mother and men who never cohabit with the mother but demonstrate caring intentions towards the child would obtain automatic guardianship rights where the mother consents to registering their name on the birth certificate. So that's the way to go, the England and Wales and New Zealand approach. It's a pragmatic child-centred reform. It does not equate unmarried fathers too closely with marital fathers, respects the primacy of the married family under Article 41, while simultaneously affirming that the state is committed to improving the legal situation of the unmarried father and vindicating the familial rights of the non-marital child as far as practicable as required by Article 42a. Now, I suggest that compulsory registration of the father's name on the birth certificate should work hand in hand with the acquisition of automatic guardianship rights. Similar to England and Wales, Irish legislation provides for compulsory registration. Um, I refer, of course, to the Welfare Reform Act 2009 in England and Wales, but also similar to England and Wales, this uh, part of the Civil Registration Amendment Act 2014 has not yet been commenced. I would argue that when it is commenced, the need for the mother's agreement should remain in order to alleviate concerns surrounding the automatic acquisition and abuse of guardianship rights by fathers who would use such rights to interfere in the mother's life or those who might pose a danger to mother and child. Section 6 of the 2014 Act could be amended to enable the mother to provide the registrar with a statutory declaration and accompanying evidence setting out in detail why her safety or that of the child or both requires that the father's details should not be registered on the child's birth certificate. So throughout this paper, as you can see, I've been looking at um, balancing the rights of the child, the unmarried father, and of course, the um, rights of the mother, because in Ireland, the mother has a 
personal right under the constitution to the care and custody or guardianship of her child. So I think, you know, my uh, proposal proposal here for changes to legislation would respect that right as well and protect mother and child where necessary. So to close, I would say that uh, the means by which an unmarried father can acquire guardianship following the birth of the child without going to court are unsatisfactory, as we've seen. His right to um, acquire guardianship is too dependent on the quality of his relationship with the child's mother. My proposal is straightforward and easily understood by people, especially lay people who don't understand statutory declarations or complex cohabitation requirements. You know, registration on the birth certificate means you acquire guardianship rights. I I like the sound of that. But subject to the mother's consent, because we must acknowledge that there are situations where um, fathers might acquire and abuse guardianship rights and interfere in the mother's life or pose a danger to mother and child. You can see my paper in the forthcoming CFLQ if you would like to read more in depth about what I have, apologies, very hurriedly discussed here today. Thank you very much.